So we are here with Peter Abbott, OBE, uh, the British Consul General in New England. Congratulations, by the way, that Order of the British Empire was bestowed you. upon you recently, correct? That's right. Yeah, I actually, I got the award a few years ago, but I, uh, for various reasons, partly because uh, of the pandemic and partly because I've been so busy in Boston, I haven't had a chance to get back to London to actually uh, get the award, the uh, but I did award. that a few weeks ago uh, at Buckingham Palace, and it was really a wonderful occasion. Thrilling. And so you have been the British Consul General in New England for the last four years? That That's right. Yeah, we arrived deep in the pandemic um, in uh, September 2020. Wow, that must have been a unique set of problems to confront in addition to everything else, because you, of course, you move your whole family here. Where had you been posted before? So we, we were in Pakistan um, mm. before coming here. So imagine um, uh, living the first six months of the pandemic in Pakistan wow. uh, and then trying to find a way from Pakistan to the UK, to Boston, with all the quarantine and testing and things that were needed back then. It's hard to remember what it was like, but when we flew from Islamabad to Istanbul, which was the only route that we could get out, mm -hmm. We were, there were about five people on the plane uh, and all the, the, the stewards on the plane were in hazmat suits. Um, and so it was really, it was really quite an experience. It was intense. How old were your children at that point? Oh, gosh. Uh, our eldest was eight. Uh, so they were eight, uh, six and three, probably wow. something like that. So they were quite young. <laughs> My heart really went out to people with children under 10 during that whole experience. But it just was so difficult to get to have them understand what they needed to do to cooperate right sure but kids so, are really resilient aren't they oh, they, yes. they just bounce back <laughs> oh yeah well uh, pakistan must have been just a fascinating experience so you arrive on beacon hill there's that beautiful uh british consulate home there where you've been and where the offices are these last few years just first of all from growing up in the uk you know what were your impressions of america uh, uh, when you were growing up as a kid, and and how was the actual experience of Boston compared to that? So I've, I've actually spent quite a lot of time in the U.S. Mm. Uh, over the course of my life. I, I went to high school in Northern Virginia. Mm. Uh, I worked on Capitol Hill for a bit. I mm. worked in California. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, my first posting in the British Diplomatic Service was as chief of staff to our ambassador in Washington, which okay. is where I met my wife, who is American. Oh. Uh, so I've got quite a sort of a you know, you know, East Coast and West Coast right. kind of experience. So you've been American uh, of America. culture. You understand Americans <laughs> intimately. <Yes. laughs> well, yeah, well, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's what diplomats are supposed to do, right? Yes. I mean, we're supposed to get under the skin of the cultures that we uh, we are posted in. Um, and so I, I do feel uh, that, uh, you know, I, I understand Americans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well. I have to ask, uh, do the children speak with a British or an American accent? Uh, it depends on which words. Um, uh, so they've got this funny kind of transatlantic uh, accent at the moment. Well, we <laughs> we'll, soon, we'll, soon bang, we'll soon bang that out of them when we, when we go back. Right. When you hear someone in Massachusetts say WADA, <laughs> I always think it's very similar to the British WADA. You know, the, the, we, we drop our R's because of our ancient exactly. British and Irish accents, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, talk about, you know, we always, as Americans, talk about how proud I think we, we all are on both sides of the Atlantic of the special relationship, mm. particularly since the end of World War II. What do you think it is that has sustained it, though, in the 80 years since the end of the war? Well, I think it's I think it's lots of things. Uh, I mean, firstly, to your point about World War Two, we have, of course, just celebrated the 80th anniversary of D-Day um, just happen. last week, an extraordinary uh, anniversary, some incredibly moving scenes from Normandy uh, of some of the last surviving veterans mm. of that campaign where British and American troops fought side by side with Canadians, with French and with many others from around the world mm -hmm. to to fight for freedom. Um, uh, and I think that was the that was the the nucleus of it. Um, but then after the war, we worked very closely together on a whole host of um, projects. Um, we worked very closely on the Manhattan Project, for example, uh, mm -hmm. and then during the Cold War, very closely on nuclear submarines, nuclear powered submarines and things. And that cemented that sort of science and technological relationship. And I mean, now that extends to everything right. from tackling climate change to curing cancer. And we, you know, mm -hmm. our, our science 
connections are very deep. Obviously, uh, art and culture is is very intertwined. You know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, British artists play at American uh, music festivals all the time. You guys consume Downton Abbey and Bridgerton yeah. just as much as we we consume uh, your amazing TV shows. And so there's a very much a kind of a a, a cultural uh, a cultural connection. connection. And uh, you point out that now, in terms of business and technology, certainly the future of AI or you know with the presence of MIT, Harvard, uh, there are such international uh, students there. But the UK and the US uh, work in terms of business and technology quite closely together. Yeah, very close. We have over a trillion dollars invested in each other's uh, economies, and that is that is just growing. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the, the greatest privileges for me here has been seeing British companies uh, come to New England and open their first office here. Um, so. Recently, River Lane, which is a, a British company that makes operating systems for quantum computers, uh, opened its first um, U.S. headquarters in in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and going the other way as well, one of my one of the things I'm most proud of uh, was watching Moderna uh, break ground on a huge new vaccine manufacturing facility uh, in the UK, a multi-year uh, investment uh, in the UK's life sciences sector. So seeing these seeing these things going going both ways has been really really satisfying. Yeah. What would you say you know, when you go back to London? And people might ask you, in terms of all American cities, what is it about Boston that makes it so unique, so special? Um, I mean, you've got to start with the history. Um, uh, it's just a remarkable, remarkable place. I was um, uh, down on the harbour side uh, in December for the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. You were Pretty very good natured. Strange, that. strange place for <laughs> His Majesty's <laughs> representative to be. But it was just an amazing, it was an amazing night. And I know there's a whole host of anniversaries kind of coming up as we go get closer to 2026. So I think yes. the history is remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that makes Boston really really special, two things. Um, the first is the just incredible concentration of talent um, and, and entrepreneurship here. Really, the world faces a lot of problems at the moment, and I'm pretty confident that um, a lot of those problems will be solved by people, by companies um, based here in Boston. So that innovation ecosystem is extraordinary. And then the final thing I will say, uh, given that the Celtics seem to be doing pretty well this year, uh, uh, is that the sports, uh, the sp I mean, this town is just sports crazy. Um, I've never been a huge sports fan myself, but it's hard to hard not to get carried away when you live in a place like Boston. <laughs> it's true. Between the Patriots, Celtics, Red Sox and Bruins, did one become your team or did you enjoy watching <clears throat> one of them in particular? One sport? Oh, Evan, uh, poor, poor, that's, that's, that's or, a little or, bit or, dangerous. <laughs> or the revolution, right? Because That's a little bit dangerous. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. What I will say is that I've always been a baseball fan. I've always yeah. liked baseball, but the Celtics uh, really took the Prince and Princess of Wales to their heart when they yes. um, went to watch a game uh, at TD Garden in December 2022. And so I think the Celtics have become a pretty special yeah. team for us. That was fun. I do have to ask you, you did oversee quite a few enormous uh, events and changes while you were here. The visit of the Prince and Princess of Wales, of course, uh, the sadness of the death of Queen Elizabeth, who Americans uh, clearly adored, uh, the coronation of King Charles. Uh, when you are responsible uh, for you know, being in the US when these huge events happen with the royal family or anyone in the UK government, you know, it's a big responsibility. What, what do you see your role as or any, any uh, British Consul General uh, representing your government here? I think the the main role is to be a face uh, for uh, for the, the the sort of official mourning that is taking place in a situation mm. like that um, to facilitate um, uh, spaces for people to pay their respects. So we had a a book of condolence both here at the residence for VIPs, and it was signed by. Governor Baker, by Mayor Wu, by a, by, by a whole host of um, dignitaries. Uh, and we had a book of condolence at the Old North Church as well. That over, well over a thousand people queued up yeah. uh, over two or three days to sign Were you that. taken aback by that? By I was. I mean, I, you know, we, we all knew that, that Her Majesty was was loved around the world, but I, I wasn't prepared for the, the just the outpouring of, of grief and the number of people that travelled from across New England, actually, and, and further than that, um, to sign the condolence book. And that had stories about how the Queen had touched their life or the life of their family. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, it was it was an incredibly moving week. And I just have to say, at the very end of it, I was opening the Highland Games in New Hampshire. Um, and they invited me to lead a minute silence in recognition of the Queen's passing. And at the end of the minute silence, about 200 bagpipers started with a rendition of Amazing Grace. Mm. Uh, and I still get goosebumps um, thinking about that sound and that that sense of emotion and respect that they were paying. Yeah. It's extraordinary. All right. We're going to take a quick break and we will be back with British Consul General Peter Abbott. Okay. I'm talking with the British Consul General in New England, Peter Abbott, who will be leaving to go back to London after four years here in Boston uh, with his family after representing uh, his government and uh, now first the Queen and now the King. Um, I do have to ask, you know, in New England, we are inextricably linked, as you pointed out, our histories. Uh, and, and it is so interesting with uh, Brexit having happened and various uh, dominoes kind of falling now, going into effect uh, with the relationship between the US and the EU. You know, from your perspective, how do you see the United Kingdom forging its near future when this decision has been made? Well, I think we're several years now um, since since Brexit. And, and um, of course, it's had an impact. Um, it would be very hard uh, for it not to have had an impact. But I think there are very, very few countries in the world that could have um, dealt with that impact and managed that impact as well as the United Kingdom uh, mm. has. And in fact, I see now very little difference uh, in terms of the kind of the trading arrangements that we have, particularly with the US. And in fact, a number of British companies that might in the past have exported to the EU or set up business in the EU are looking uh, westward instead uh, and, and are doing that here in the US. So I think from seeing from where I sit right now, there has certainly been uh, a benefit to it. The UK has always been an outward looking global, uh, globally connected country. Um, and that that hasn't uh, and that hasn't changed. I think, um, you know, we will continue to be one of the most open uh, and interconnected economies in the world, particularly on services, but but also on manufacturing. I think we're the fifth or sixth largest manufacturing um, uh, country in the world. So we still have a tremendous amount to offer, uh, even if we're not quite as closely connected to the EU as we were before. Sure. And it's so interesting where the United Kingdom is positioned. There has been so much upheaval in Europe with the uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, war going on. Um, you know, what's your message to Americans as we look to how our relationship with the UK and Europe will evolve over the next few decades? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, America should... Um, you know, really turn away from the whole concept of isolationism and, and keep an eye on supporting democracies around the world? Or, you know, what does the government think about how the U.S. should uh, look at Europe in terms of the next few decades? I forget who said it, um, but uh, America has frequently been described as the indispensable nation. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is really no global challenge uh, whether in war or in peace, mm. uh, that does not need uh, America's intervention. Um, I think nowadays it's very hard for any country uh, to be truly isolationist, let alone a country uh, the size um, uh, of the United States. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I said before, last week we celebrated the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the one message that we took from what the veterans were saying, the people who had actually fought on the beaches at Normandy, uh, was not just remembering what happened 80 years ago, but, but continuing to pledge to stop it happening uh, again. Mm -hmm. Ukraine uh, is the first war in mainland Europe um, for a very, very long time. And I think all of us have to take that exceptionally, uh, ex exceptionally seriously. Um, and we should be in no doubt that uh, Putin's invasion was was illegal and wrong, uh, and that we should do all in our power to work together, as we are doing, uh, to uh, to support Ukraine. Right. I, I, I can't remember the Churchill quote exactly, but I know he said something like, it, it'll take America a very long time, but in the end, they do the right thing. <laughs> so hopefully uh, those words will live up uh, this century as well. And I do have to ask you, it, it is really interesting. You know, Americans uh, love your royal family and uh, the role that King Charles plays now, taking the baton from his mother. He seems to really want to modernize the monarchy, which is fascinating. Are you just, uh, you know, you, you have an American wife, you've been here so much. It is interesting, isn't it, how Americans really do 
admire the royal family, love to watch everything that they're up to, that they're doing. Well, you know, you could you could have them back if you, <laughs> if you wanted to. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, we wouldn't say no. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I mean, it's it's yeah. uh, you know the, the, this the is royal... a fascinating cultural fixation. It, it is, it is, um, uh, and I think it's testament to the power that monarchies have. And I think, mm. particularly in the UK, they fulfil a, a really important constitutional role within within the framework of our of our democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think to have a head of state that is above politics, that is separate mm. from politics, actually, uh, is a very wise. Uh, thing to do and you know our, our system of government has uh, survived for over a thousand years mm. uh, because of the wisdom and the checks and the balances that have been built in uh, to our unwritten constitution uh, over uh, over those hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years sort of an um, apolitical constant it is, it is a, a political constant and 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 the the international reach you know when the princess of wales came forward to talk about her cancer diagnosis and the king as well uh, of course, that does a tremendous amount for people researching uh, their own possibility of cancer or yeah. medical institutions around the world. And we certainly wish her well and hope that she is going yeah. to do well and that the king is going to do well moving forward as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I think the more people talk about these things, I mean, um, the Prince of Wales, Prince William, has also been very open about mm. mental health uh, yes. issues and has, has championed uh, charities across the UK that have, have, have been supporting people who are suffering from mental health issues. And so just talking about some of these things actually really does uh, give people hope and give people courage to to persist. Yeah, it is. We forget that presidents and queens or kings would never have even mentioned such a thing uh, several decades ago. So it is is yeah. an enormous sea change. Uh, as you head back to London, uh, what do you hope to accomplish in your career? What's next for you in Whitehall? <laughs> so, uh, so I go back to London after this. We've been overseas for uh, nearly ten years, which is quite long for a for a diplomat. The UK was, as you said, still in the EU when when I last lived in London. So it's important to go back. I think from time to time and to understand your country uh, that you represent overseas. I'll be going back uh, to do a policy role uh, in London. Uh, I've been doing lots of representational and sort of public diplomacy work here in Boston, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I need to go back and and, and help support policy development machine. Uh, in London, uh, which is something I love. I mean, it's intellectually very challenging. It, it exercises a different part of your brain. Um, uh, but I'll certainly miss all of the, the sort of speechifying and interviews and things uh, that I've got to do here in Boston, including with you, Paula. Um, love you've been absolutely terrific. Oh, well, it's been fascinating. I, I love your tea on the tea. Uh, yeah. social media effort that you've done. Americans were very willing to, or Bostonians, to talk with you wow. uh, on the MBTAs. They traveled along. Um, I'm sure we could take a few uh, pointers from the tube, uh, which has been <laughs> running a little more successfully and on time uh, for longer than the MBTA, but hopefully we'll fix it. And any last message to people in Boston and New England? Just really a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for um, for welcoming us so wonderfully um, and for all the people that uh, my, my path has crossed with uh, in Boston and across New England. We've traveled a lot. Uh, it's just been wonderful to get to know you. Uh, this really is my favorite region of the United States. Uh, you are blessed with a huge uh, amount of extraordinary things for your landscape, to your food, to your sports, uh, to your science and innovation. So we'll, we'll miss it very much. So thank um, you for having us. Well, Peter Abbott, thank you so much for being such an exemplary representative of the United Kingdom here in New England, and we wish you and your family nothing but the best in London. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to get to know you. Thank you, Paula.